Hello, my name is Mark Corbett. I'm the pastor of Severn Baptist Church. And I'm recording this message so that the members of our church can uh, watch it at home during this time when we're not able to uh, gather together in person. Now, uh, today I'm going to be talking about the atonement because this is the Sunday before uh, Easter weekend, including Good Friday, the day when we remember the fact that Jesus uh, died for us, Christ died for us. So let's open in prayer and then we'll, we'll get into uh, the message. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will bless this message and bless everyone who listens to it and that uh, you will um, encourage us by the great wonderful truth that Jesus died for us and help us to understand more deeply and fully, a little bit more deeply and fully, what that means. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. And uh, I do need to keep track of the time here. Okay, here we go. So Jesus died for our sins, and this is called the atonement. Now, the atonement, uh, the, the story of Jesus dying for our sins, it is the climax of all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, each of these Gospels tells the, the story of, of Jesus' life while he was on earth. And um, they, they tell different aspects of his life. They overlap a lot. But, um, for instance, Matthew and Luke include uh, the story of his birth, but Mark and John do not. And... Uh, they include some of the same teachings, but uh, some of them have different parables and different teachings from Jesus' life. But for all four Gospels, the climax of the story is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the central event in the Bible, and it is the central and most important event in all of history, uh, quite, quite literally, in the whole universe. Uh, we can also see this when we think about the fact that the main religious ceremonies of the Old Testament looked forward towards the atonement, looked forward towards Jesus uh, dying for our sins. They symbolized that Jesus was going to die for our sins. The main religious ceremonies of the Old Testament excuse me, um, they involved making animal sacrifices. And uh, of course there were uh, real animals, real sheep and real um, uh, bulls being uh, sacrificed, but all of these animals were uh, symbols, symbols of a much, much greater sacrifice to come, uh, symbols of the fact that Jesus himself would be the ultimate sacrifice and that Jesus would be the one who made true, complete and lasting atonement for our sins. So that the religious ceremonies that God gave his people in the Old Testament looked forward to the cross, looked forward to the atonement. Likewise, the main religious ceremonies of the New Testament are designed to remind us of what Jesus did on the cross. So the New Testament ceremonies are designed to cause us to look back towards the atonement. The main religious ceremonies uh, uh, ever since the time of the New Testament for Christians have been uh, baptism uh, and the, the symbolism of going down in the water reminds us that Jesus died for us and was buried and rose again. And when we have faith in him, his death counts as our death. And then the Lord's Supper, communion. The, the purpose of communion is to remember Jesus and what he did for us. That uh, he allowed his body to be broken for us. And, uh, and he allowed his blood to be shed uh, for us to the point of death. Jesus died for us. So this is the um, remembering this and thinking about this was the purpose of the ceremonies that God gave his people in the Old Testament and it's also the purpose of the ceremonies that God has given us to practice today as 
Christians. Now what I want to do next is I want to look kind of quickly at some of the phrases that the Bible uses to describe the atonement. And um, we can look throughout the whole Bible, uh, but we are just going to take a sample from the New Testament. And I'll talk about them a little bit, but uh, the main thing I want to do is just show them to you. Uh, so in Matthew 20, uh, Jesus said that he came to give his life as a ransom. And uh, this reminds us, uh, for one thing, that the, the atonement involved him giving his life. He would, um, he would actually physically die uh, as a ransom. Reminds us that he's making a payment to set us free. And then in uh, John, Jesus said, I lay down my life for the sheep. And of course, we are the sheep that he laid his, his life down for. In Romans, we, we are told, speaking about Jesus, he was delivered up for our trespasses. Uh, it's because of our sins that Jesus was delivered up to be crucified and to die. Uh, also in Romans, it says Christ died for the ungodly. And then just two verses later, it says Christ died for us. And those two statements are saying the same thing because um, all of us were in the category of the ungodly until our sins were forgiven. And then when our sins are washed away and um, we're given as a gift of forgiveness and then God begins the process of transformation, uh, then we are made righteous. Not with our own righteousness, but with the righteousness of Christ. Christ died for us. In 1 Corinthians, it says Christ died for our sins. And in 2 Corinthians, it says one died for all, speaking about Jesus. And, and he died for all. So he died uh, for, for all of us, so that all people who put their faith in him can be saved. It's, uh, in Galatians, Speaking of Jesus, it says, who gave himself for our sins. And then later in Galatians, Paul speaks of Jesus and he says, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now this is one of my favorite uh, phrases referring to the atonement. And um, the reason is that this one makes it uh, personal. It's true that Jesus died to save um, uh, humanity and to save a people for God uh, that would come from every tribe and language and, and, and nation. We'll see that in just a minute. Uh, but it's also true that Jesus died for you personally and Jesus died for me personally so that Paul can say Jesus loved me and gave himself for me and I can say the same thing. Thank you. Thank you. You died for me, Jesus. And if you've accepted Jesus, and if you haven't, he wants you to, if you've accepted Jesus, you can say, Jesus loved me, and he gave himself for me, referring to his death on the cross, the atonement. Christ redeemed us from the course of the law. Um, and then in Ephesians, it says, Christ also loved us, and gave himself for us. Later in the same chapter, it says Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So yes, Jesus died for each of us individually, but he also died so that we can come together and be the people of God. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians, referring to Jesus, uh, it says who died for us. Uh, 1 Timothy, who gave himself as a ransom for all reminding us again of this idea that he, he paid a price in order to set us free, to set us free from darkness, to set us free from sin and all of the consequences of sin. He gave himself for us to redeem us, as Paul writes in Titus. And then the last one we will look at is uh, from Revelation, uh, where it says, You purchased people for God by your blood, from every tribe and language and people and nation. So all of these phrases are talking about 
what we call the atonement. And it's, it's a biblical word. Uh, it's what Jesus did for us when he died for us on the cross. Oh, the great, great love of Jesus. Now here are all of those phrases um, on one slide, on one screen. And I just wanted to gather them uh, for you in one place. I'm not going to read through them again, uh, but so that you could have it all together. And we could have added many more to this. And I want you to feel that uh, what a huge foundational theme this is in the Bible, uh, that Jesus died for our sins. Now the next thing that I want to talk about is uh, theories of the atonement. Considering how central the atonement is to the biblical story and to Christian theology, it's not surprising that in addition to celebrating it at the Lord's Supper, singing about it in our songs, and praying about it with a sense of awe uh, when we pray, thank you Lord, that you died for me. Uh, in addition to this, we also think deeply about its meaning and how it works. And, and we should think about it and discuss it and study uh, all that the Bible says about it. Now, theories about how the atonement work uh, are called theories of the atonement or you could say atonement uh, theories. And atonement theories uh, seek to answer questions like these. Uh, what does it mean that Christ died for us? Uh, how does the atonement work? Uh, uh, a, a man died 2,000 years ago. How does that make a difference in, in, in my life? What does it do? What does the atonement do? Why was it necessary? What does Jesus save us from? And what does Jesus save us to? These are examples of the types of questions that people think about and do our best to answer based on God's truth found in the Bible as we think about the atonement and what it means. Now, studying theories of the atonement um, can be confusing and there are several reasons for this. For one thing, um, there's a lot of different theories of the atonement. And if you Google, for example, theories of the atonement, uh, you'll find um, some articles that will list three or four theories. In, in a few minutes, I'm going to share with you uh, three, but one of them is kind of in two parts. So you might say four um, of, the, of the most basic theories of the atonement. But some articles list seven or ten or more theories of the atonement. And if that's not bad enough, people have different names for the same theory or different names for theories that are very similar. And then uh, each theory is a little bit different, but they overlap and they're uh, interconnected. And then any theory, different people explain it uh, sometimes a little bit differently. Um, so all of that can make studying theories of the atonement uh, confusing uh, and yet we can understand the atonement. It reminds me of gravity. Um, can a child understand gravity? Well in a way yes. Uh, you can teach a child, for instance a child in elementary school, you can teach them that gravity is the force that makes things fall to the earth. And the child can understand that. Um, now if the child uh, takes uh, physics or physical science in high school, they'll learn a little bit more about gravity. They'll learn some mathematical equations about gravity and, and how to calculate how strong the force is and how quickly things accelerate. And, and then if they take more advanced physics, they'll learn how gravity walks when things are in orbit like planets and how the moon circles the earth. What does that have to do with gravity and satellites and spaceships and um, uh, gravity starts to get more complex. Uh, but then there's even deeper and more complicated levels of gravity. And the truth is that still to this day uh, some of the world's most brilliant physicists continue to study gravity and they don't understand it all. 
Well, the atonement is like gravity. Can a child understand the atonement? A child, for example, in elementary school? Yes, they can understand basically the ideal that Jesus died for our sins. As we grow in the Lord, should we learn more and more about the atonement? Not everyone needs to learn more and more about gravity, but Christians should learn more and more about um, what Jesus did when he died for us and what it means and why it's important. And uh, all Christians can, can learn more about the atonement, and yet even the greatest theologian doesn't fully understand the atonement, just like even the great, greatest uh, scientist, the greatest physicist doesn't fully understand gravity. Um, but I want, I, I hope and pray that the Lord will help us through this message to understand the atonement a little bit more than we did before. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss three major atonement theories. And um, the first one is sometimes called moral example. Uh, sometimes it's also called um, uh, uh, Christus Exemplar, um, and it kind of has two parts to it, uh, God demonstrating his love, and then uh, influence, so sometimes people call this moral influence, which leads to us imitating Christ. And then the second major atonement theory uh, I'm going to discuss briefly with you this, uh, today is called penal substitution, or Sometimes the, the full title is Penal Substitutionary Atonement. It sounds complicated and not very exciting. It turns out it's right at the heart of the gospel. And um, it's just kind of a complicated name for something very uh, basic. And then the third one will be Christus Victor. How the atonement is related to Jesus defeating the forces of evil. Now, uh, the fact that there are different atonement theories brings up a question. Which of these atonement theories is uh, correct? Which one is right? Which one is uh, true? And the answer is, if these atonement theories are presented um, correctly, all of them are true. All of these are true. Now, some people have come up with atonement theories that... Uh, I do not think are correct. But you do not have to choose between um, the uh, moral influence and example of Jesus, uh, penal substitutionary atonement, and Christus Victor, because they all work together. They're all true. Sadly, there are some theologians, some preachers, some Christian, or they claim to be Christian, uh, uh, writers and authors, who um, set these theories against each other. And often what they do is they will say penal substitutionary atonement, that's the one they don't like. They'll say that's not true, uh, this other one is true. And what they're doing is they're creating a false dichotomy and there's no reason to have to choose between them because they all work together. The, uh, a, a brilliant Christian apologist and thinker named William Lane Craig. Uh, at least I feel like he's blessed by God with uh, brilliance and, and a good ability to, under, to, to understand and to teach God's Word. Uh, he said this about the atonement. He said, The doctrine of the atonement has thus been aptly compared to a multifaceted jewel. Aspects of the doctrine such as penal substitution or moral influence should not be thought of as complete, standalone atonement theories, but rather as facets of a richer, multifaceted theory. In other words, the atonement is like one big, beautiful diamond. Um, it's one event. Uh, it's one truth that Jesus died for our sins, but it has many facets to it. And, and God's light and love shines through it uh, in different beautiful sparkling colors. And these are like the different theories of the atonement that all work together. So, let's begin by talking about 
uh, the moral example theory and the first part of that we could call a, a demonstration and uh, this is where God proves his love to us and um, God God didn't have to do this God loves us and he wants us to know it he wants us to be confident of the fact that he loves us so this is one of the things that Jesus dying for us does in Romans 5 8 uh, the Apostle Paul inspired by God wrote but God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners Christ died for us so sometimes in this world um, we get hot and we get afraid and we get confused and we can be, t be tempted to doubt that Jesus loves us um, but we need to hold on to that truth because holding on to that truth changes everything about the way we feel, the way we think, the way we act. And we know that Jesus loves us. How do we know? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But the most important part of the Bible when it comes to, to knowing that God loves us is the fact that Christ died for us. That proves beyond any doubt that he loves us so that no matter what happens even when we don't understand why things are happening like we might not understand why this pandemic is happening but we can say I know that God's got me I know he loves me because he loves me I know he's going to be faithful I know his promises are true Jesus said no one has greater love than this uh, to lay down his life for his friends God proves his love and knowing that God loves us changes everything. When we know that God loves us, it washes away fear, it washes away anxiety. Because the greatest, most powerful, all-knowing being in the universe cares about you. And he cares about me. And that tells us that even if temporarily things are scary and we don't know why things are happening, it gives us confidence that God's promised that he's working all things for the good of those who love him that that promise is going to come true because God loves us. Now the um, example that Jesus set shows us that God loves us but it's also supposed to do something else. It has another very important function that's part of the atonement. It's supposed to influence us and lead to us imitating the great love of Christ. God calls us to follow the example of Jesus. Now, this is taught in many places. So we're just going to look at a couple of examples. In Ephesians 5, 2, it says, um, And walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. So, God wants us to walk in love, in other words, to live a life of love, loving other people, that's what it means. And the example he gives us to motivate us to do this, and also to tell us what does it look like to live a life of love. Look at Jesus, and especially look at Jesus dying for us. And that should motivate us to love others, because if Jesus loves us that much, if he was willing to give that much, we should be willing to give to others. And then later in the same chapter it gives a, a specific application of this truth. Husbands, love your wives. How? Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So um, we are called to love our wives not in a way that's taking and selfish and self-centered towards ourselves, but the way that Jesus loved, in a way that involves sacrifice and giving and serving. That's the kind of love. And the example of Jesus teaches us what we should do and motivates us to love that way. In Philippians, Paul writes, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. And the example he's giving is that uh, Jesus was willing to give up the, the, the splendors of heaven and become 
a, a, a man, a person, and, and, and to give up using um, all of his, I don't know how to say it, all of his God abilities and to live as a human so that he got tired when he went, walked a long ways and he got thirsty when, this, when it was hot outside. And, and, but not only that, Jesus was willing to uh, die for us and to die a terrible death for us and we should love other people the same way that Jesus loved us. We should be willing to give up things uh, that we, uh, in our own lives. We should be willing to give up our money, our time, our comfort in order to love other people. This principle is captured in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1 where Paul writes, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Christ is our example and especially his willingness to die on the cross. Examples are powerful. We are designed in such a way that when we see an example, it shapes how we uh, act and live and talk. If we hear somebody talking a certain way, we tend to follow that example eventually. When we hear, see somebody acting a certain way, the tendency is that we tend to act like them. Um, and this is especially true when the example is someone that we look up to and is someone uh, powerful. Um, you know, I, I can think of a little example of this from when I was in the Navy and I served on several different uh, submarines. And um, uh, like all ships, we would occasionally have a field day well, uh, obviously there aren't any fields on the submarine. All that meant was it was a, a, a time, usually several hours, that we would spend cleaning uh, the submarine. Now we did some cleaning all the time every day, but this was deep cleaning. This was getting down in the cracks, down uh, in the dirty places, under the machines, sometimes under the, the down in the bilges, in, in the, in, in, and really doing some deep cleaning. And it was kind of dirty uh, walk, some of it. And on one of the submarines I served on, um, the captain, who did not have to do this, uh, there was no expectation, no requirement, no rule. But when it was field day, he would put on a, 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 an old, kind of like, yeah, it was kind of like an overall type of uniform. And he would find some difficult to get to behind some greasy, dirty machine place and get down there and he would clean himself and he like I said he had no obligation to do that he had walked his way up to being the captain uh, nobody would have thought he was doing anything wrong if he walked on other things in his office during field day but by setting the example of, of cleaning and picking a dirty hard cleaning job wow it motivated all of us to clean because we thought if the captain can do that who am I to not want to get my hands dirty? That's what Jesus did for us. If our king was willing to suffer and die to help others, who am I that I wouldn't be willing to give up some of my money, some of my time, some of my comfort to serve others? The power of example. This is one of the things that the atonement is used for. But there's a problem. We fall short of the glorious example of Jesus Christ. Even when it's influ influencing us, none of us live up to it completely. Honestly, we don't even come close. We all do things we're not supposed to do. We sin. All of us sometimes don't do the things that God wants us to do. And uh, that's a problem. And then we realize how big this problem is when we think about God's justice. God loves us, but God and God is also just, and that's good. We don't want a God who is okay with evil. And uh, there's something in our hearts to cry out, cries out for justice. And there are many phrases in the Bible. These are all biblical phrases. Um, I don't have the Bible verses, but you can Google them, and if you wanted to verify it. And, and, and there's many phrases like this, uh, talking about God or God speaking, I will judge you according to your conduct. He will repay in full, talking about God. God says, I will repay, I will repay them according to their deeds. 
in the walk of their hands, and so on. And the point is that um, none of us dissolve eternal life, and all of us dissolve death and destruction because we fall short of the wonderful, glorious, right, good example that Jesus set for us. This is why the uh, moral influence theory of the atonement, while it's true and it's beautiful and it's good, if it was the only part of the atonement, we would be in big trouble because it does have a good influence on us, but we still fall short and we've sinned many times. And so we need to talk about the next major section of, of, of the next major facet of atonement theory, which is called penal substitution, or sometimes more fully is referred to as penal substitutionary atonement. And just to let you know if you're reading about this, um, lots of times people uh, abbreviate it PSA, penal substitutionary atonement. It's kind of a mouthful, and it doesn't sound that exciting, but what it refers to is very exciting. It's the call of the good news. It's how we get saved. It's the reason that God isn't going to pay me back for my sins, what I dissolve. That I'm not going to be destroyed. That I can have the gift of eternal life. This aspect of the atonement is so vital, foundational, and important. I was trying to ward this in my own wards, and, and this is what I came up with. Jesus died in my place on the cross. He took the penalty that I dissolved for my sins. As a result, through faith in Him, my sins are paid for and I am forgiven. Thank you, Lord. I really mean that. Thank you, Lord. Jesus took my sins and gave me His righteousness. That's substitutionary atonement. Now, where do we see this in the Bible? Well, it's a, the answer to that is a is a big answer. There's whole books written on this. We could have not just a whole sermon just on this one topic. We could have a whole series of sermons on where do we see this in the Bible. And in fact, there are whole series of uh, teachings and sermons on this topic. But I'm just going to give a brief, tiny a sample of where we see this in the Bible. One of the main places we see it most clearly is actually in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 53. Now I have the most relevant part of that chapter up here on the screen. The letters are kind of small. Uh, I'm not going to read through all of those verses, but I'm going to talk about some of the phrases and words that are in that chapter. And of course, if you want to read it, uh, one of the advantages of doing this by video is you could just stop the video and, 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 and read it, either on the screen or from your Bible, but um, in this chapter, God's plan is revealed. Not all of it in one chapter, but this this really important, excuse me, this really important part of God's plan where He makes His righteous servant. That's uh, a prophecy talking about Jesus. Um, he God makes His righteous servant a guilt offering, and. Uh, the people who heard Isaiah back in his day would have known what that meant because they had guilt offerings all the time when they, when they killed animals to atone for their sins. But this wasn't going to be an animal. This was going to be God's own son. He makes his righteous servant a guilt offering for our rebellion. Now, in parentheses, I have the verse numbers in Isaiah 53. For our rebellion, for our iniquities, our iniquity again in verse 6, our rebellion again in verse 8, our iniquities, again in verse 11, our sin, for our sin, He, the righteous servant, Jesus, is pierced. He is crushed. He is punished. He didn't do anything wrong. He's punished for my sin. He is struck, and it results in His death. As a result, we are healed. We can have peace with God, and Jesus will justify us. That means He declares us innocent, not guilty. The price for our sins has been paid. 
And it wouldn't be right for God to make that, that price be paid for again. Jesus already paid for your sins. If you trust in Him, then that payment has been applied to your life like it has been to mine. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That's what penal substitutionary atonement is talking about. And it's a foundation of the gospel. And if, if we had time, uh, we could look in other places like uh, Romans 3 and 4 and, and other places in Scripture as well. Uh, but now I'm going to move on to Christus Victor. Another uh, facet of the atonement, one that we don't think about as much these days, or at least many Christians don't, uh, but the Bible talks about it and it's very important. Uh, Christus Victor, another way of saying it, is Jesus defeats the devil and all the forces of evil. And the cross plays a key central role in Jesus defeating the devil and the forces of evil. Now, uh, this uh, is first hinted at way back in Genesis chapter 3. Here God is speaking to the serpent and the serpent is the devil. Uh, 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 the serpent, somehow the devil was, was speaking and walking through the serpent or taking the form of a serpent. And, and, and God says to him, to the devil, uh, I will put hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. Her offspring uh, is referring not to one of her children, but to a great, 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 and many, 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 many great grandson in terms of his humanity, Jesus Christ. So Jesus is in, con is in a war, he's in conflict with the devil, and God says, he will strike your head, he's saying this to the devil, and you will strike his heel. Now this is a, a symbolic way of saying that the devil is going to cause Jesus to suffer, like if you got... Uh, like if a snake bit you in the heel, it would cause you to suffer. But Jesus is going to crush the devil's head. And you don't, re you don't recover from getting your head crushed. In 1 John, we read, The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's works. Now you may be thinking, wait, I thought uh, the Son of God, Jesus, was revealed to save me from my sins. It all goes together. The devil uses your sin um, to ins the people's sins. He uses the sins of people to enslave people and to entrap people and to lead people towards a road that if they don't find a salvation in Christ, that road will lead to destruction. And Jesus came to destroy that walk of the devil. And Revelation is talking about people who have followed God and people who believe in Jesus is that they conquered him, him being the devil. They conquered the devil by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they did not love their lives to the point of death. They conquered him by the blood of the Lamb that's talking about the atonement that enables us to uh, overcome the devil in our lives uh, here, now. now in Colossians, Paul helps to put all this together for us. He writes, And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt. So when we sin, it's like we have a debt that has to be paid for. Remember, we've talked about payment a lot tonight. Um, I keep saying tonight because I'm recording this tonight. I don't know what time you'll be listening to it. But anyway, he erased uh, the certificate of debt with his obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. We don't owe any debt anymore. Our debt was nailed to the cross when Jesus was nailed to the cross. And when Jesus died, our debt was paid for. And then in verse 15, it says he, talking about Jesus, Disarm the rulers and authorities. And here Paul is referring to 
um, not human rulers and authorities, he's referring to the devil and the forces of evil. At least primarily that's what he's referring to. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. So it seems like these facets of the atonement go together. The devil is able to do his work by enslaving people through their sins. But when Jesus forgives us of our sins, and then through his example and his influence, he starts to change us so that we sin less and less. We, we, we get free from the devil, free from uh, the fear of death, free from his uh, deadly evil control, and the works of the devil are destroyed. Christus victor. This is part of the meaning of the atonement. So I want to draw this all together with this conclusion. Through the atonement, made for us when Jesus died for us, God proves that he loves us. He motivates us to follow the example of Jesus and to love others, pays for and forgives our sins and defeats our ancient enemy the devil. Praise God. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that Jesus died for our sins. So much was accomplished on the cross. You set an example for us. You, you showed us that you loved us, so we never have to doubt that. You set an example to teach us how to love others. You pay for all our sins so that we can have the gift of eternal life. And you defeated the devil and set us free from his dark domain and brought us into the kingdom of the Son you love. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.